Richard, I want to welcome everyone to the 45th Lava Sunday Salon. We have a, a lot of introductory ground to cover. Um, that's our boss for time. Okay, we're going to get it up. Thank you everyone for being here. So excited. Um, so very, very excited. Should I turn up? How is the sound? Do I need to turn the mod buttons? Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> How is that better? Is that better? Is that better? Is that better? Good, good, good. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. okay, I want to thank everyone for being here. We've been off for a year, so we're just so grateful to be back. Um, this has been sort of an interesting road. Uh, uh, it's, been, it's been a long time since Carpool at St. Augustine by the Sea School that Adele and I sort of, sort of came together when, when my sister and her daughter were friends. But um, Kim and I came back into Adele. Adele owns this place. Adele Yellen owns this place. Uh, Kim and I properly came back into Adele's sphere about a year ago to help save Angel's life. Adele Yellen is chairman of the board of the Angel's Flight Railway Foundation. We'll get into Angel's Flight in a minute. Um, we uh, properly got, got, got back on board together, and I, I think as a result of working with the Angel's Flight Railway Foundation, we were able to realize that we had a lot of shared goals, and one of these shared goals was to activate this space, and Lava had a need for space, so Adele, out of the goodness of her heart, God bless her, let us, is letting us do this. Um, Andrea Alonso is coming down. She's, she works for Adele. We could not do this without Andrea. And when she walks down, everyone will, will, will wave for her. So we're super excited to be back. We um, have been many places. We started this salon like five years ago, Clifton's Cafeteria, which has been Cliftonized. And um, we've been, okay, we're here now. We're very excited. I'm going to get Nathan Marsak on in a minute. There's so much to say. We're just going to say it as it comes. After the salon, at 2 o'clock, I have my walking tour. It's not my walking tour. It's a walking tour with about six tour guides that I'm sort of in charge of. Is every, how many people are signed up for that tour that are here? Great. Um, I don't know if there's space, but if, if you can wait five, ten minutes. If you want to go on the walking tour, you're not registered, just give me five, ten minutes once the salon ends, and we'll just do a head count and make sure we don't have like 150 people. Because <laughs> that's more than are signed up. So let's just quickly get into this. Um, I have a couple things I wanted to go through. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, Kim and I give bus tours. As a tour. If you go to our website, if you use the, 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 dis if you use the, the discount code nothing but Nathan, you get 10% off. At our hospitality table, we have that written down. Okay. Change your raise your hand. Change your the hospital. Raise it high so people can see it. That's our hospitality table. All these things we're about to talk about. Are the oh, this is not. Okay. Does everyone see this? I think we need to focus this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is an ad for Brand Central Market from 1940. All right? To the women of Los Angeles, balancing the budget is no cinch, but that's not news to you. But what can you do about it? You need a certain amount of food to keep healthy, and you can't cut down on quality. So you need to enjoy meal. You need to enjoy meals so you can't cut down on quality. Therefore, that leaves but one solution to keeping your budget intact, namely buying where prices are lowest. Here are some suggestions. Come down tomorrow to Grand Central Public Market. Watch the many thousands of shoppers stocking up for the weekend. See the exciting low prices in every department. Then do your own buying. You'll be enthusiastic over the reasonable values, and you'll still be money ahead. Okay, this is right before America. This is, this is a year before America enters World War II. Um, and these are just the prices. Apples, nine pounds, 25 cents. French bread, half, half, one pound and a half loaf, 12 cents. Fried shrimp, uh, a roll and a coffee cake, 17 cents. Okay, wow, amazing. Um, I know, it's, it's amazing. Uh, this is a photo of Grand Central Market taken about that time. This is 1940. Wow, right? We're going to do this every every month. We're just going to have amazing photos from Grand Central for a minute or two. This is a photo of Grand It is? <laughs> there we go. 
This is a photo of the Hill Street side in 1964. They remodeled in 1964. This is down now, but I really like this photo, so I thought I'd share it. Yes, cars are great. This is a photo of Grand Central Market opening day. Okay, this is a Japanese floor shop on Broadway, on the Broadway side. Opening day, which is October 1917. I know, I love it. Okay, um, more shameless promotion next week. A week from today, Kim and I have a forensic science seminar. We work with the Cal State Los Angeles Criminalistics Department in their crime lab. We do quarterly forensic science seminars on crime. Next Sunday, we're doing a crime lab with two cultural anthropologists who are involved in ritual mutilation techniques which are culturally accepted in their countries of origin but are illegal according to the county coroner's office and other local law enforcement agencies. So this is a, a crime lab about people that engage in, in ritual mutilation and they show up in ERs and their parents get arrested. And also we're going to focus on a case in Mat Matamoros, Texas in 1988. Uh, a college student, an American college student on break, was kidnapped and cannibalized for a Santa Muerte ritual. And we're going to get into that. It's a lot of fun. It's all up there. It's all, we have QR codes for everything at the hospitality table. Our next Lava Sunday Salon. This is the most important thing I can do today. Miriam, come on up here. Come on up. Our next Sunday Salon is Sunday, June 26th, right here. And Miriam, Miriam, you're going to talk. Your, your mom is in. Your mom is on the left. She's the blonde on the left. Miriam, you're going to tell us about your mom. Your, your, the salon next month is about you and your mom. Hi everyone. Uh -oh. So I think we have a real treat for you guys next month, especially for those of you who love Clifton's Cafeteria this spring. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, so I have a real treat for you guys next month, especially for those of you who love Clifton's Cafeteria history. A few years ago, I discovered my mom's long forgotten diaries from the 1950s when she was a camera girl at Clifton's Cafeteria. So, actually, she's an Almonte girl turned Clifton's Cafeteria camera girl. Now, if you didn't know in the 1940s and 1950s, the camera girls were the ones who were meandered around the Brookdale and the Pacific Seas locations taking souvenir photos of all the tourists. So, the memorabilia that my mom had was stored away, kind of collecting dust and disintegrating. And about a year ago, I started a blog called The Diary of Film. So, and the the history that's in the diaries is just barely kind of scratching the surface. So, so for next month, uh, we'll be sharing amazing never-before-seen photographs like the one we have here. And we'll be reading them as diary passages for secret diary passages. Um, my sister Victoria will be playing the voice in Dilemma and we can read those passages. So my sister Victoria is going to actually talk a little bit more. I'm Gomez's other daughter, Victoria, and so I just want to um, invite you to please join us next month, and we're going to explore Gomez's flamboyant lifestyle as one of the Clifton's, camera, Clifton's Cafeteria camera girls. We will also be documenting the family-run photo studio called Keep Safe Photography. They employ the camera girls and operating the business in the basement of Clifton's Brookdale location and also Clifton's Pacific Seas from 1945 to 1969. We will also be exploring Vilma's crazy nightlife and the playground that was once vintage Los Angeles, where she wined and dined at some of the hottest nightclubs of the time with a date every night, sometimes two dates a night, Yes, sometimes three. It's all true. You won't be hearing about it. Uh, also, everybody's welcome to join us Saturday, I'm sorry, Sunday, June 26th at the next Lava Salon. Um, also, we're going to be riding um, with Kim and Richard. 
to the city of Almani oh. on the blood of the Elfman Survival Story. We're going to get to that. Okay. We're going to get to that. Oh, good. Okay. Good. Thank you, everyone. Hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Uh, right up. So next month, we're going to do Nathan. We're going to do another walking tour next month. Hill Street, number 14. Sign up for it. It's good. Jordan, you're going to be there? No, you're not. Oh, well. We'll be back. We're going to do a, a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of time travel blogs. They're all up at the front. 47 is crime. I mentioned this in passing. Nathan, you're going to be talking a lot about Bunker Hill. This is our, our history blog about Bunker Hill. So a lot of what Nathan's talking about is on our blog on Bunker Hill. And you can go look at that. And we need to get through. This is our uh, Broadway blog. We're running out of time. So we keep going. Uh, Tim and I give tours. August 30th, we have a low down on downtown tour. And we're going to go into the uh, Dutch chocolate shop. The Mattel Dutch chocolate shop. So get on that bus. We're almost done, Nathan. Miriam and Victoria are getting on this bus tour of ours, Blood and Dumplings. It's our El Monte crime tour, and Vilma's a part of that tour. So if you like Victoria and Miriam, get on the Blood and Dumplings tour. We have dumplings in Vince Lugo Park. I know, it's a lot of fun. And I think that's it. Kim, did you bring your book today? Nope. No, you didn't? Oh, well. Okay, forget about it. <laughs> Angel's Flight. We'll talk about saving Angel's Flight. Everything, all the QR codes for this is on the hospitality table. Angel's White's been closed for almost two years. It's very bad. We'll talk about this in the walking tour. Okay, Nathan, we're going to get into your talk. Okay, let me get you queued up. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. And Nathan, let's get your talk set up. All right, so Nathan... Oh. Yes, okay. All right, Nathan, you're going to do a couple of things. You're going to give us this talk with the slides, and we've got some film clips at the end, if you still have some time. Okay, so tell us about these film clips really quickly. It's not too much to remain at them all. Well, because we're going to exit out here, we're going to be right where uh, the famed Angel's Flight site used to be. We have a number of luminaries in the audience tonight, so to speak. One of them being right over here, Jim Dawson, raise your hand. Yay, Jim Dawson! That's the man who wrote the book about Bunker Hill uh, as it exists in film and literary wow, history. Um, so basically, I stole everything from him uh, and compiled a bunch of film clips of Angel's Flight in cinema, all the great noir movies and stuff like that. It's really cool, it's about 26 minutes long. We'll see how much I blather on, how much Rich will say, like, you know, as Richard does. Okay, you got five minutes left, and I'm like, but I got a hundred slides left. And I'll go through them and then really quick. So, it's a really cool little uh, bunch of fun clips. You know, the usual suspects, you know, your Kiss Me Deadly and stuff like that. But also, early stuff like All Jazzed Up from 1920, Impatient Baby from 1932, which was James Whale's next book right after Frankenstein. And we did like a little rom-com, it's really wacky, and uh, got angels by then. So, little seen, little known, and we'll get to see that. If you did. Should we start this talk? I don't know. Let me introduce you. Thank you. Okay. Let's, uh, Nathan, why don't you get started? So, you're going to give us this talk about Bunker Hill and in the midst of its demolition. Does everyone understand that Bunker Hill, this, that Grand Central Market was at the foot of where Angel's Flight was? Angel's Flight was demolished in the beginning of 1970, third in Hill, took it down, they put it back up in 1996. Um, and this was the bread basket for Bunker Hill, this Victorian neighborhood, which are now all skyscrapers. And so Nathan, you're going to talk to us about this, this lost world, how it came to the ball. That's right. Although, we're going to talk today less about Bunker Hill. In fact, after a while, you're going to be like, what's going to talk about Bunker Hill? We're going to talk less about Bunker Hill, but we are going to talk about the way we talk about Bunker Hill. Because that's why it's called, you know, the myth. Because, okay, it's a fine line. It's a fine definition between you know, myth and mythos. So myth is more like the, the phenomenon that the narrative brings to understanding great truths, if you will. And, and a mythos is more like sort of a story that a culture has to understand things. But remember that that story in the mythos comes from an alleged or secondary source. And therefore, it always has some issues with it. To wit, I'll be 
at a cocktail party or a, a funeral, uh, the subject of bunker will come up, as it does. And, uh, and there's always a very common narrative to the story. When people when talk about bunker people are always like, yeah, okay. There's a whole bunch of giant gingerbread Victorians, and all the rich people abandoned them. They went out west, and their inexorable march to the sea. And then, all the noir guys came in and they like, pulled down hats and they had balls and beat girls and stuff like that. But then, then there was a cabal, you know, shades of the nude suits and the bird and octopuses and stuff like that. Uh, there was a ruthless cabal of guys in jackboots and they were bankers, they were banksters. And, and they worked with money men and they tore it all down so they could put up banks. Banksters, they love banks. Um, to which I say, yes, okay, there's some truth to that. Again, mythos, legend and secondary sources. Uh, because I say, yeah, I mean, granted, it was all torn down by, you know, some, some jackpooted thugs, but what if I told you that, as true as that was, then what if these jackpooted thugs were like liberal civic organizations, women's groups, ethnic groups, the American left? He'd be like, oh god, what sort of talk is he going to do? This guy in a suit. Well, you're in for it now. Because when I started putting this together last night, and I told all the partners, I said, here's what's going to happen is I'm going to burst your bubble on all of these sort of assorted downtown LA and Bunker Hill common collective beliefs. So let's start. First, Thing we gotta do. That's a swagger sleeve. I like that thing. Ah, this is a. Uh, I didn't bring my swagger sleeve today. I brought my uh, my butt off. Cause I like I like to point. So I generally have to do that a lot. Now let's see if I know how to work this up. <laughs> okay, so, here's the thing. As we know, when we talk about myth, there's a universal design for a very clear dichotomy between the villain and the villain. And it usually falls into two camps, or one camp, two sides. Like each other, which is a uniform. We know all about this, don't you the little guy is good, the big guy, the big guy is bad. So here's a, here's a quick little little guy, and he turns and he says, You, who are you? Unknown, untalented draftsman. And the guy says, George, the untalented draftsman. Uh, I've sat some of you, Hunt. George, do you want this commission? And George says, Oh, I don't know. I usually, uh, I usually consult with my brother on these things. So he goes home and he consults with his brother, who's dead. Stop. Because his brother Mark, who's been dead for a number of years, he gets on the planchette board, and his brother tells him, from beyond the grave, take the commission. You will become famous. So not only does he take the commission, but he bases the whole thing on this wacky, wacky science fiction book he just read about life in the year 2000. And what does he come up with? The craziest building in the history of crazy town. All right? Look at this thing. No, yeah, right. It's kind of sort of standard Italian late Renaissance meets your, you know, local sesame brownstone Romanesque thing going on. But it's 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 the you know that 45 by 120 foot interior atrium that is the most world famous thing in the entire world. Puts Los Angeles on the map. Everybody's happy. Hooray for the little bit. Okay, it's only one problem. Yeah. Okay, so the story completely didn't exist until 1953, when Wyman's daughters tell it to architectural historian Dr. Leslie Esther McCoy, who never goes and checks any primary sources and uh, just prints it verbatim. Now, don't get me wrong, if I could get away with saying that my dad designed this, I'd, I'd be all over that too. But the fact of the matter is, George Wyman, not an untalented draftsman, he was actually with the film Peter and Burns when he designed the, for example, 
the dining hall at the Soldier's Home in Sautel. He was actually set up his own private practice at the Perez Ball Block on Broadway. Oops. Um, when he was the consulting engineer. Um, no, Hunt actually hired him a year later to be his consulting engineer again for the Burn Block. Keep the corner across from it. You know, it's rather magnanimous of Hunt, isn't it, to say, like, well, you, you lowly draftsman, you stole, like, the commission of the era, I'm hiring you again to be my draftsman again. It doesn't hold water. And most importantly, Hunt took out all of the plans for it, filed them with the city engineer in December of 91, and then again all the way through 92, Hunt's filing all the plans, and then in the Illustrated Herald, immediately after that, it says, and look, here's all of Hunt's plans, including the interior atrium. So God bless the George Wyman story as told by Esther McCoy in 1953, up to and including the, he based it all on the wacky book about life in the year 2000. However, as much as I love Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward, the name of the book, there was also a very important building, which if you're familiar at all with Victorian architecture, which I trust you are, or otherwise, out with you. Very important building called the Cleveland Arcade, of course, in the style of the times, sort of vague Romanesque revival, of which it's only Romanesque very important at the time. Um, but of course, and every architect in the world knew about the Cleveland Arcade at the time, which the interior looked like this. So, Rockefeller built that and cost $900,000, which was an outrageous amount of money at the time. Bradbury financed this, which cost $500,000, man, three times over. An outrageous amount of money at the time. Which is why the two look so similar, is because basically, Hunt went, wow, that's what interior court light office blocks should look like. And then they never did it again because we wouldn't get that much money, it was that crazy. But at least we have one. So now we're going to go on the story about the big guys. Because they're bad. Because the story goes like this We had the greatest, most efficient, transportation system in the world. You know, the, the red car, the Larry, the yellow car. And then the oil companies came, and the tire companies, and it was, it was Firestone Tire, and Standard Oil, and, and who's the other about that one? Uh, General Motors, GM, they're the one, yeah. The Legion of Doom. And they conspired, but they were even convicted of conspiracy remove these and, and replace them with these terrible belching buses. And that's why we have freeways today and we all turned into this horrible automobile culture that we are today. Only one problem with that story. Literally none of that is true. I know you all saw the Frank Roger Rabbit, and God bless you. And you all saw the 60 Minutes piece, which is based uh, to monopolize. And one was to monopolize the sales of buses themselves. They were completely acquitted on um, starting Monopoly, so never happened. And the one charge they were charged for was, which was a peripheral charge, a small charge, was the attempt to, for GM, to sell GM buses to GM lines. That is not actually even ethically suspect. They were still charged for it, because it went to a jury. And there was this huge to-do about like what, even back then people hated GM. Uh, God bless America. So, so basically, that's the only thing that ever happened was GM was charged with trying to make sure that GM itself was supplied with GM buses. So they got a slap on the wrist. The judge actually told him they hadn't gone to you know the jury. Never would happen. So, point B. Don't believe everything you read. Not only that. Oh, here's the best part too. This Snell really had it in for the red car. The entire story literally has nothing to do with the red car never even belonged to National City Lines. Henry Huntington never made a nickel on it. So he could have done whatever he wanted with it. He only had it so he could run people out to the land that he owned. That's how he made his money. It, then it belonged to Southern Pacific. Then he sold it to uh, Metropolitan Coach. And you know who Metropolitan Coach sold it to? That's right. Your tax dollars at work. You know who tore up all the, the track lines for the red car? Again, your tax dollars at work. The County of Los Angeles. Don't go going on about there was a, a, a conspiracy of standard oil. Oh my God, so, where do we get all these crazy ideas? Good question. Besides Wikipedia. Well, Wikipedia is written by people, and most people have read my days. 
The first job that I had when I moved to Los Angeles in 1993 was working on a little picture called Shotgun Freeman. Anybody see it? Yeah, a couple of you. You should all see Shotgun Freeway. Shotgun Freeway is the first and as far as I know the only real documentary about old Los Angeles. Basically, me and my buddies, Morgan Neville, who has an Oscar for this sort of thing that he does, and Harry Palmberg, got in the back of a car. Andrea! Hi. She's in charge of this place. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> She's like, oh, I'm too humble. So, we got in the back of the car with like, Joan Didion, and James Elroy, and Buddy Collette, and Frank Wilkinson, we'll be hearing a lot more about Frank Wilkinson later, um, and Mike Davis, and they just talked about like, cool old stuff about LA. And so we got to know, I got to know Mike Davis pretty well, and he's pretty wacky, and he would, uh, he's got all his stuff, and everybody, you know, he just came out with a book called Ecology of Fear, and he talked, and so we just read stuff like, uh, for example, Oh, it's in the way these people. After the 1965 Walk of the Belly, for instance, downtown Los Angeles's leading landlords organized a secretive committee of 25 to deal with perceived threats, follow the mountain wall, perceived threats to redevelopment efforts. Warned by the LATE that black inundation of the central city was imminent. The committee abandoned efforts to revitalize the city's aging by well, you can read it. Shall I read it? Even more. Anyway, so then it says the bailed out committee's lost investments by offering discounts far below real market value on prices of land in the new world. For example. Like, where do you even start with this? Oh my god. The committee of 25 was started in 1952, just to be kidding. I'm sorry, with the first thing he says. I feel like Larry Harnish. Um, <laughs> you get that. Uh, that Norris Paulson was basically elected, put into office by the committee of 25. Um, as the mayor of Los Angeles in '63, they weren't landowners at all. They were, you know, corporation guys. They were not secretive at all. They were known by anybody in community affairs. Um, and all the rest of it is wrong. And just to go down to the end, uh, they didn't offer discounts for the lower market value. Those parcels were sold to the highest bidder, as required by law. I mean, that's all in black and white on the books. I, one of my favorite parts of it is like. It has to be authoritative. It has a footnote. <laughs> if you actually open the book and you go to the back and you look at the footnote, what's the footnote to? Something Mike Davis wrote. <laughs> he footnoted it himself. Now, I didn't actually go to see if that in what he wrote, if it actually footnoted something that he wrote, and so on. It's like one of those nesting dolls of footnotes to himself. But I'm pretty sure that's, that's how you don't do research. So anyway. We're getting to Bunker Hill this week. See? Bunker Hill. This is my point. This is how we get to understand things. So here's, here's a typical thing. We're going we're gonna to start talking about housing, which is part of the whole Bunker Hill concept. So here's, you know, here's downtown. Sense it's going this way. The shop is for me. This is for me. And it's this square right here. That is the old parts of, um, I know what you're saying. How did the Dodgers not have anything to do with it? There's uh, La Loma. Um, there's Bishop, there's Palo Verde, these are the three areas, areas of Chavez Ravine. They're not there. The Dodgers are there. So you're obviously full of crap what you're talking about. Um, interestingly, this whole area, I just kind of discovered this going through these maps. This whole area is actually still extinct in, the, in its entirety. Um, Solano and Jarvis and Bouet and Brooks, completely still there. You can go drive around it today. And in fact, when we think about how Chavez Ravine was completely, you know, destroyed for um, Dodger Stadium, the topography of this area is in fact still largely intact. Dodger Stadium, so I'll go down here. Anyway, I digress. Let me show you. Oh, so show you again. So again, this is F.B. Boylston Park. Uh, this right here, Jarvis becomes Academy Road. Academy Road right here. This is Academy Road that runs right here. Just give you an idea what we're talking about. So we have this like Park. This is the area that still exists. Jarvis coming this way. So basically it's this. Right. That's the old that's the old Shabbos Ravine. So, what's the deal with Shabbos Ravine? Why were there I think it was uh, 2,800 people 
in 1,200 structures via 800 families. It was settled in 1913 by a lawyer named Marshall Stimson. Stimson said there are 300 families, Mexican-American families, that are living in the LA River Basin. They're being flooded out every year. This is a crime. We're going to find them home. We're going to find homes up here at Chavez Ravine. And it also has this perfect mix. Not actually another uh, Believe it was a purely Mexican American community. It was about 60% Mexican American, 30% Anglo, and it had a small black community, it had Filipino uh, parts of it. But so Chavez Ravine is minding its own business when, when what happens? Well, to go way back, the New Deal. But let's start sort of midway, and then we'll go back later and talk about it. Can you tell up. us if we're supposed to hiss people? I'm sorry? Tell us if we're supposed to hiss at people. Huh. <laughs> well, Kim said, tell us when we're supposed to hiss at people. Yeah, you know, it's complicated. <laughs> Do you hiss at Frank Wilkinson? He was in Shopping Freeway. Hung out with this guy. Frank Wilkinson is one of the most beloved men in Los Angeles lore. He is super famous for telling Hugh Act to go fuck themselves. Who else is? Richard, who else is super famous? Your, your father. Yeah, my beloved dad. We didn't work for years because he told you I to go fuck yourselves. He was a badass. Wilkinson was a badass. These are great men. He worked for a long time to like tell, you know, worked for civil rights. He's a cool guy. But, when you get down to it, he was also the guy who went door to door and set up community meetings to go to everyone. There's, there's a big communist presence in Chavez Ravine. There were editorials in People's World saying like, come on Chavez Ravine people, like these guys know what they're talking about. Get the hell out. Sell your homes. It's the Community Housing Authority. They're a lot smarter than you are. You know, they're, they're thinking for the, the people and the worker, dictatorship of the proletariat, all that good stuff. So Wilkinson, go door to door, you know, at the Housing Authority letter, July 1950. By December 1950, condemnation proceedings had begun by the city of Los Angeles to start taking people's homes, telling them to get out, either get out or you're going to get bulldozed out. And one family after another got out, and by 1953, I've read, well, I'm going to do actually, I think I've got a map show. Yeah. So here's the 1950. I don't know how well you can see this. There's all these little dots. They're all, this is, uh, this is Malvina. It's going to come up later. This is 17-11 Malvina right there. But this is uh, Boylston, Park, Brooks, and Effie. School. And then by about early 53, that's what was left. Not only had they been removed, but they been bulldozed. I've had conflicting reports of the 800 families. Uh, one report said that 700 were gone, and a uh, city report said that all but about 10 were gone. So that about 790 were completely gone by uh, early mid 53. But then, anyway, I'm not even going to go into Norris Paulson yet. But you <laughs> see, the thing is, you would be a bad person if you were against this. Because, do you want this? Or this? Uh -huh. I know personally, you know what I did as a kid? Yeah, exactly. I was in front of the judge like God, every six months. I wasn't smoking and breaking windows and getting my ass beat by cops. And it turned me into a good person. That's what it makes me. And made me an elbow. Who was I with these kids? What a bunch of nerds. But that's not the point. So, and then who do they bring in? A bunch of shady looking characters. These guys. I would hate these guys. Especially these two. Okay. I don't trust these guys. Anyone know who these guys are? These two? Neutra? Anyone? Is that Neutra? Even then. She got it. Wow. Oh. Yeah. And they smoked. That's how you know they're bad. Um, so do you know what they proposed to do with Shadows Arena? For the good of the worker? I mean, God bless Neutra and his strong social ethic. And maybe this sort of stuff worked for some of the smaller stuff that he did down, you know, those garden court apartment projects that he built um, all through, you know, the 40s in Los Angeles. But they were going to, okay, about 100 acres of the 300 acre Shaw's Ravine was populated. So they were going to take all of it, about 275 acres of it, slice down the hills, fill in the valleys, cover it in concrete, and put up, if I remember correctly, 24 13-story buildings and 160 two-story buildings and 
So instead of 3,000 people, there's going to be 17,000 people. It's going to be Park La Brea. Hmm? Park La Brea? <laughs> like, like Park La Brea only, but all low income. Okay. And, eh, I gotta take my jacket off. Now it's getting hot and heavy. I apologize for appearing in shirt sleeves in front of the ladies. So, so the question is, let's say they built it. Let's say the social engineers have had their way. Let's say this had come to fruition. What would have happened? Would it have been all rainbows and unicorns? Or would it have gone the way of Pruitt Ico? Pruitt Ico, the famous St. Louis uh, project, uh, imploded, uh, you know. Child of, you know, 1949 Housing Act, uh, imploded in 1972 uh, because it became a nightmarish urban dystopia of gangs and crime and, 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 and rapes and the whole gossip of Shkera. Um, if they had built this, see, no one ever talks about this. Something Wilkinson said always stuck with me. You know, he said, like, you know, this would have been great. This would have been decent homes for you know, the people of Los Angeles who needed homes. And God bless him, you know, his heart was in the right place. And the road to hell is, you know, fraught with best intentions and so forth. Because what would have happened here, we'll never know, of course, but in my humble opinion, that and will get you a coffee, uh, is it would have been this sort of isolated, urban, high-rise reservation. You know, Stick the poor and disenfranchise in these things, uh, and because of the the white flight it would engender, which happened again and again, because of its location, because of its size, because of the lack of maintenance, because of the lack of management, which happened again and again in these things, uh, it would have become just an incredible nightmare. You know, so thank God it didn't happen. Now, what did happen? Well, you know, they sold. Okay, we canceled the contract with. Uh, Los Angeles canceled the contract with uh, the feds in July 1953 after the election of Morris Paulson because of the McCarthy atmosphere, the red baiting atmosphere, it was communism, it was really called cash, citizens against socialist housing. And um, so it sits. The, the feds sell it back to us with the proviso that it be used for a public purpose. So it sits for 50, 53, the rest of 53, 54. 6 through 55, 6 through 56, 6 through 57. And in 57, that O'Malley character is rolling birding over and he looks down because he's looking for a place and uh, he says, what about that place? And was, I think it was Kenneth Hahn who completely outsteps his authority and says, take it. And that's why we have Dodger Stadium. But remember, there was all that time in between. So if, if you really want to blame someone, because you know, Wilkinson, I was in the right place, but you know, a, a dedicated party member. You know, don't blame O'Malley. You know, blame Uncle Joe. It was Stalin who took all those people out of Chavez Ravine. Not Walter O'Malley. So I'm tired of hearing that old ludicrous trope. Cut it out. I say. Okay. Where are we going next? I don't even remember. Oh right. Yeah. What was interesting about it is the only two members of the city council. Like against the whole thing was like the one really super right wing one and the really super left wing one. That, that was true all the way through the whole bunker Um It was Holland who was like, "You can't do this to people." He said, famously, like it is morally and ethically questionable to take people who have forever lived on the ground with chickens and gardens and fresh air and, and, uh, uh, and small animals and put them in high rises. Just can't do it. And the whole idea of like taking their land and their eminent domain is just anti-American. And he was considered a right-wing nut. And then of course it was Edward Boyball uh, who said basically the same thing. So if you're a nut on either side, you're right. Everybody in the middle can go go screw. Okay. And the women of Chavez Ravine also, like a lot of people in Chavez Ravine were like, hooray! Because they were promised first dibs in this new housing development, which sounded great, but a lot of them were like, no, we like to have chickens. So. Still very popular in the neighborhood. Still very popular in the neighborhood, that's true. The chickens are shot at Now, but what is the most iconic image of all of 
Shamas Ravine. What's the one you always, always see? Oh, wait. I'm not quite there yet. Right. I, I love this. I love Mrs. Bia. It's like, she lifts her eyes as if to see the vision of the vast project of the 13-story apartment houses. To city planners, possibly the Elysian Heights development with its wide window apartments, its recreation areas, its sunny gardens, its tree-shaded avenues is a dream come true. But to Mrs. Bia's eyes, and to those of many like her, it's a nightmare. Uh, they knew it was up, they knew it was coming. So yeah. The Arechica family. That is the most single iconic image of the whole thing. Laura Vargas, torn from her home by these white jackbooted thugs. Me, I'm down. I'm down with the Arechica family. She was their daughter. Why am I down with them? Because they're a bunch of spoiled rich folk. Yeah, they're my peeps. Um, no, really. Everything you think about this isn't true. I was talking to a uh, uh, guy who does uh, Chicano studies, uh, does the brown power stuff in the 60s and stuff like that. And, uh, and he said, yeah, that, that basically, that image, like basically like, was like the one from the 60s that we all refer to because these are the people who became destitute because of O'Malley and stuff like that. She didn't even live there. She could have gone to one of the two homes that she owned. Oh, her parents who lived there owned two other homes. They used them as rentals. about like property rights and chickens. Basically, the city had offered them like $11,000. They had a private appraisal done that said they could get $17,000. So they said, look, if these statists are going to come, these bastards are going to come give them now like all this money, we should get our money. So everything we believe, the opposite is true. I know, that's the stuff I find out. I just love it. What do we got next? Oh, right, there's the shot of uh, their sign where it says, uh, They only ask for a fair price for their property. That's all they want. That's the little, little Ivy sleeping. And Avrana, Arechida. Don't mess with her, check her out. She's awesome. She's the meteor of the clown. Coming up. More stuff. And then there was the terrible snowstorm. <laughs> this public housing? Well, very briefly, under the PWA, they became slum clerics because it was believed... Well, I guess I should start with this. Okay, it's 1929, and for some reason, people were disenchanted with laissez-faire capitalism. I don't know why. Uh, so in the early 30s, they got this big Keynesian stick-up over here uh, because, you know, the whole Keynesian economics idea was the state would get involved in everything, and they believe that they can make everything better through state intervention, and that the state be best, and you know, God bless them, best intentions. Um, and that's where you came up with all the alphabet agencies. Uh, and the whole Roosevelt Coalition, you know, you had the NRA, not the NRA, but the National Recovery Administration, and the TVA, uh, and you had the, the Public Works Administration, and they started clearing slums. In 1933, they cleared like 10,000 slums in New York. Um, the National Housing Administration starts in 1934, and from there is born the United States Housing Authority in 1937, and from there comes the Housing Act of 1937, which then helps local authorities like ours in Los Angeles build public housing. Frank Shaw says, hey PWA, come to Los Angeles, build us lots of stuff. Can we hiss him? Huh? Can you hiss Frank Shaw? I don't know. There's going to be a picture of Frank Shaw there. I'll let, I'll let you guys decide. Okay, yeah, I know, yeah. Half of you, yeah, we'll divide the room into pro Frank Shaw and anti Frank Shaw. And then some of you will get your cars blown up. Okay, so let's look at some of these housing uh, projects. I know we don't have all the time in the world, so we're going to build these very quickly. So, at some point, we're going to do. Where's Richard? Richard, are we going to do a, a public housing tour? It's going to be amazing, isn't it? It's going to be amazing. Yeah, so this is going to be some of this stuff. These are the ones. Look, Brian Kaiser, what's up? Oh, hi, Brian. Some of the ones built under the 37 Housing Project. Check them out. Boom. Boom! Oh, look at the guys that are this. Paul Williams, I mean, Lovely Beckett, Neutro, Rancho San Pedro. Oh, Lisa. The late lamented Elisa Village. This one, like, crew at Igo had to be blown up because it got too, uh, too crazy. Um, a favorite of mine, William B. 
Hacienda Village is the one now named um, Gonzuego Court. It's like at 103rd, and it's up in Watson. Um, if you're ever near Hacienda Village, like don't even drive a blue car. Like anything blue, you will die. Okay, because that's blood territory. Hacienda blood is big. Okay, so, so some of the stuff built uh, under 1937. So we have this huge public housing. Uh, until the 1949 Housing Act. Now, now it starts to get meaty because of the, the incredible and important difference. And there's a reason I put, it should go Title I and then Title III, right? No, but I put Title I below for me. Title III. Federal gift monies are low, local housing is low, they earn 10,000 units. Okay. Title I was the game changer. Title I was the reason Bunker Hill got torn down and the reason it wasn't covered in public housing. Because, specifically, guaranteed capital grants to eliminate substandard housing through large scale land assembly and slum payments. Roosevelt had the New Deal, Truman had something called the Fair Deal. It was believed that we were going to clear the living hell out of America's slums and blight. And th that's the the common idea there was, you know, people were, I think I got that one. Okay, well, the idea being, well, oh, talk about that. Let's some of these. I love that so much. Whoops. Jordan Downs. Oh, I'm not even talking about the 8,000 units of housing we built for war veterans. Uh, like Kepler and... Roger Young, stuff like that. But strictly speaking, I don't count them because they weren't really, they were more like Swanson Huts and Barracks. But for example, Jordan Downs was originally, um, that sort of stuff. There's, there's a funny Jordan Downs story. When Frank Wilkinson, this is something to remember. When Frank Wilkinson went to Jordan Downs and he said, Look, people, you know, this is going to be great. We went to their community meeting. You know, we're going to build all these like, amazing houses. And he was, he was shouted out. And he was booed, and he was, you know, things were thrown at him by 200 families. Because they were like, look, we don't want the California Housing Authority, you guys, to come down here and kick us out of our homes because it's mostly African American families, Mexican American families, and they're like, where are we going to go? You know, this is, this is Los Angeles, it's the 40s, it's a very segregated city. You're giving us this embarrassing pittance of money for our houses. We can't go anywhere, and he's like, you're gonna go here. They're like, we, we worked and scrimped and saved our entire lives to be like a family that owns a house. You're gonna take it out, you're gonna make us live in this? And he's like, yeah, we're awesome. We're government. We know it's best for you. Nature's and Gardens, largest housing uh, this side of the Mississippi. Paul Williams. Wow. Aliso Apartments gets an extension. Uh, we, we added on the Pueblo del Rio. We had it on the Rancho San Pedro. 194, yeah, that's a lot. All famous Imperial Courts. Bunker Hill. 
I know. And the demolition of Bunker Hill. What's up with that? Where'd that come from? I don't know. Title I. Mixed with a couple other things happened. 1945, we had the Community Development Act, which basically said, we're going to acquire land for the common welfare. And it doesn't matter if it's residential, it doesn't matter if it's industrial, it doesn't matter if it's commercial. We can just do this. And so, the CRA, you all heard the CRA, trust me. The CRA is both a reaction to the 1945 um, uh, CRA Community Development Act, but also they understood that the 1949 Housing Act was coming down the pike. So they formed, sort of as that was going to come, anything not conforming to its highest and best use, was going to be, they basically have the ability to just take it. Because they knew best. Now, that might be good for your neighbor's house, because you don't like your neighbor, but you wouldn't like it if you are or you wouldn't like it if you, if you like your neighbor. Now, so let's talk about... What? Oh, that's cool. So let's talk about the history of demolition in Bunker Hill. So it's actually not like such a new thing. People think it all came with the city in the 60s and stuff like that. But here's an article from 1912 talking about the estimate of the cost of leveling Bunker Hill. They were like, you can't see it, no. Uh, they were talking about leveling Bunker Hill way back then. They were obsessed with the idea. This is the only time you're going to hear about it. It was a bunch of like evil money guys in suits at the California Club. Um, do you know why the Committee of 25 couldn't meet at the California Club? Because Lou Wasserman was a member of the uh, Committee of 25, and they wouldn't let Lou Wasserman in the California Club. Anyway, uh, and so they couldn't kick him out because he was Buffy Chandler's so best friend. And when, when Buff Chandler like, said something, like, oh my God, who did that? Okay, that's not important. Um, where's the going with this? All right, so, so the guys in the suits, they were like, it's a, it impedes progress, basically, like, they were like, we gotta drill tunnels through it because it's impeding the progress and stuff like that. And they said, why would we drill tunnels through it? We could just level it. So, the tunnel associations were like, you're right, we'll just raise it. Makes perfect sense. The removal of Bunker Hill undoubtedly would make for the immediate betterment of the present business district. That's absolutely true. Now, aesthetically, of course, the tearing down of the hill would be a mistake. Bunker Hill has long been the most picturesque feature of downtown Los Angeles. Though in a city which is so abundantly blessed in this regard, the loss would not be so great. Is it? They're basically saying, LA is so beautiful. Oh, we can certainly afford to Bunker Hill. Little did they know how beautiful it is. Oh, yes. The west side is going to be so beautiful after the 70s. Anyway. And, uh, so, yeah, so you might be thinking, how would they, it was 1912, they don't even have like cars, barely. How would they tear down a giant hill? It happened all the time. Like giant hills in Seattle were removed, giant hills in Portland were removed. They basically just took giant high pressure water hoses and just washed them away. So here's a picture of uh, the regraded Seattle removing a giant hill. Interestingly, this looks a whole lot like the fluid, which is low water hill, a whole lot like the hotel lot on uh, the corner of Second and Hill. That looks a bit like the uh, fourth hill structures. There. Anyway, so the idea sort of fades away after a while, then it comes back in the late 1920s with the Bigelow plan because they kept saying, look, this, this hillock is an impediment to progress. Um, and by then, of course, it was getting a little more went down, and there was more of a bunch of renters instead of homeowners, and they were worried that it was going to be full of transients and stuff like that. And so they, they start adapting these ideas as to how, I mean, for example, it is a well-known fact that shoppers will not walk up a steep grade, which is why there's no San Francisco, apparently. Uh, uh, and public influence on property in every direction. But that's the last you're really going to hear about these, these creepy money men from the California club, because they disappear in favor of these creepy people, uh, the housing authority. You know, slums breed crime. It's a very liberal attitude. A conservative would say, 
if you commit a crime, that makes you a criminal, don't commit a crime. Uh, but the liberal would say, well, the slums commit the crime, so we got rid of the slums, and then everybody basically is a better citizen. As a conservative would say, just be a better citizen, you jerk. Anyway, and everybody fights about it forever. Let's all have a drink. Okay. So slums commit crime, so what do you do? You cross out slums! Because Lord knows life will be better than that. It's like, not bad. Somehow that will change people. It will change their brain chemistry. It'll make them perfect. It'll make them come home from their crappy job and not hit their kid. Because they'll be like, Look, I have a sink. I won't even quote to you the studies about the way, like, crime, domestic violence, and things like that went up after people started moving in to these projects. Ooh. It went really bad. And not like in the 70s, like we all know it was bad, but like immediately, like in the 40s. Richard, how many times have I said these things? Density. It doesn't work. People hate me. Go on curb that you say that. They will literally reach through your computer and kill you. Okay. So. Hey. Look, everyone. Frank Shaw. Yeah. Frank Shaw famously known as the most corrupt mayor in the history of corrupt mayors, and rocking, rocking the mustache that made the 30s famous. <laughs> you know, he's also the guy who went to the feds and said, you know, well, he also loved, you know, he loved puppies, and he was kind to his mother, so why are you being so mean to him? And because he said, we're going to the feds, and we're going to get money for low-income housing, low-class housing, and we're going to understand the needs and problems of the underprivileged in the city's population. See? He may look like Hitler. But socialist literally in his party's name. Oh, oh I won't give you over there. Oh my god. So it's your problem. Something radical, bold, progressive, out of a blighted area. So they're talking about Bunker Hill way before the 60s. It was blighted. We need something bold and progressive. Frank Wilkinson shows up, and you know, Mrs. Mrs. Pembroke and Miss Worthington Penny Farley is like, oh dear, how do you live like this? Frank Wilkinson is like, well, it's because of you. You have too much. You have too little. But people, people generally weren't weren't hip to it. Look, think of the children. People went nuts. Not only because of. The idea of like, you know, the LA Times, of course, went crazy. They were like, oh, it's communist. You know, you're paying your neighbor's rent. And that's, you know, next thing you know, we be hammers and sickles, like, on our flags. And we'd be like, I'm sorry, you know. Yeah. But, but basically, like, you know, it was just seen as un-American, and it was also, like, they didn't want it in their neighborhoods. There's a lot of nimbies and people were picking it. crazy. They were marching on City Hall. President Truman, I want my property back. Property owners, property owners will sue the union. The AFL and the CIO were huge, deep in the, the public housing racket. But along came the plan for 37 height limit towers for Bunker Hill. There they are. Height limit means, you know, you all know the concept of height limit, nothing could be taller than 13 stories because nothing could be taller than City Hall. Although, strictly speaking, these would be taller than City Hall because it would be on a hill. But nobody really thought that part <laughs> For them not to be taller than City Hall, they have to be about five and a half stories high because then you put a ruler over there. Anyway, um, so the, that was the redevelopment study, but because uh, of Title I and the loopholes there, and you didn't have to actually, didn't have to be coupled with public housing. And because of the 1937 law, which was an equivalency, every time you was, again, for 7,200 people, something like that, or 9,000 dwellings, 7,000 people. Anyway, so there's the first plan. It goes before the voters. 
proposition to see, how are we going to fund this, the 3,715 story buildings, not, not the luxury type, but rather designed for the working man, rents easily within your reach. So it's not public housing per se, but still sold as uh, for the working man. The voters shoot down. They say no. Prop C does the choice. Basically, the CRA, right after that, so the Bunker Hill project is dead. The CRA goes from like 13 employees to three, like overnight. The CRA is dead. Bunker Hill's dead. It's going to be the last thing we heard about it. But then there's something called Proposition 18. And Proposition 18, I still have not quite figured this out. That goes before the voters, and that is something involving like revenue, tax, equity, finance involving this. Point being, I don't understand it. The voters didn't understand it. They voted it in. And basically, as long as the CRA kept tearing stuff down and getting the money from the up tax or the redevelopment, it basically gave them the money to do whatever they did. So all they needed to do was keep tearing things down, and they could still they would just get more money. So Prop 18 revitalized the CRA. So they go to the big boys and they say, let's go nuts. There's nothing can stop us. Basically, all we have to do is have the city council vote for it and uh, and ring life win. And that sealed the deal for Bunker Hill. And that's why it didn't have to be housing. Um, that's why it ended up being the big banks, although they were going to So that is sort of like, and, and also there's a fundamental shift between a sort of community modernism that we see in. Avalon Gardens or Nickerson or any of these places, and a sort of corporate modernism. But I mean, that's a greater fundamental shift in general in the way we built, and that's a whole other lecture right there. So the sort of larger corporate blocks um, are going to be. Does everyone understand what we're going here? Are, are going to be sort of de rigueur, especially for a part of town this close to downtown. But that's the Edison building. And there's the second street, what's the second street town? Right there. So basically, Figueroa, First Street, Fifth Street, and Hill Street. Okay. So the idea was, big corporate blocks. It drags on, it drags on. There's various lawsuits. The city council finally gets voted in in July of 1959. The CRA finally gets their hands on the first building in 1961. It was the Hillcrest Hotel. If you've ever seen, um, he kisses me deadly and Ralph Meeker. He walks up all the stairs and he goes and he says, like, you could have a heart attack walking up here. And, uh, and the lady says, who invited you? That was great. That was right there. And in a way, and someone points this out. Maybe this is in, in your book, but uh, someone points out that it's roughly analogous to, like, he's the CRA. And he's like, ah, you're getting a heart attack. And she's like, who invited you? Like, who invited these outsiders to Bunker Hill anyway? So what's the first thing that goes in? Is it, is it housing? Is it something nice? And then you're like, well, oh, hey, don't get me wrong. I did like corporate modernism. Um, but you know, this was on the site of the 1929 Kramer and Wise Art Deco Monarch Hotel, which was, you know, little remembered, but a gorgeous Art Deco masterpiece. Um, if you know this building, you know it was tragically we had a Halloween prank gone wrong, uh, painted white about 10 years ago. I have no idea what one. Uh, it used to be a great building, it's now been destroyed, so God bless it. The second thing to go in, of course, was actual housing. Here's uh, Robert Alexander, who has gone from being a, a proponent of. He just wanted to build big things. He didn't promote housing to like, you know, market rate stuff. Um, this is Z-Wing Griffin. He took over the community redevelopment uh, agency from uh, Sussman. And Kim, who's that? Where are you pointing at? This guy. Yordy. Yordy. Thank you. Yordy. That's right. Yordy side. Yordy. Yordy. Come on, everyone. Yordy. 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 And these, these are the two uh, towers four and five that we're going to build. For them and painting them this goofy color. And it's just It's like. As if Bunker Hill wasn't bad enough. Now the actual, like, almost good parts of it that ruined Bunker Hill, now they gotta make them even worse. Oh. 
Now you're like, oh my god, now we're gonna get to some Bunker Hill like you. So, now that I've dispelled a bunch of myths about Bunker Hill, let me talk about Bunker Hill and why I got to manage <laughs> in this thing that they need to um, Let's talk a little bit about some other things about Bunker Hill. For example, there's a very common conception that the CRA came in and demolished all of Bunker Hill, and what a bunch of jerks they were. But, here's something you may not know. There's lots of really amazing Bunker Hill that disappeared long before they ever got there. Let's look at some of it now. For example, the LG Rose Mansion. Hold on, let's check. Absolutely perfect. Total, total masterpiece. I could go on about this house for an hour, but I'm not going to. Um, but after the owners in the 20s basically abandoned and moved to the Fremont Hotel across the street and uh, let it, actually, not across the street, but just there in front of it, let it sit to rot. Stop that. Um, in the 1930s, the city was going to put indigents in it, and the keep was just in such bad shape. They're like, no, we won't even put guys who don't have homes in it. Um, if you ever see the old uh, stinker in old Chicago with Tyrone Power, when they tore this down, they used the wood from that uh, as the built sets. This may uh, have a record as the shortest time on Earth. If you know the Newsom boys, well, you know, some of the greatest California architects there are, uh, Joseph Kaplan, Samuel Newsom, Newsom built this, Elvin Ryan, uh, who moved up to Westmoreland, and he said, you know what I'd rather do? I'd rather build a hotel here. So this is an early, like, I'm getting out and I'm building hotels on Bunker Hill kind of guy. In his defense, it's a very ugly house. What? Huh. Interesting thing about this house, like, there's like, hey kid, kid, cut it out. Uh, like 14 steps here, 12 steps there, it was like super crazy, like... Don't make me come over there. Do it, do it, do it, do it. Super crazy, like worried about bad luck, but you know, bad luck for the house, it gets torn down. Brunson Mansion, this was a crazy show place, Abram Abelman. Um, the Brunsons went through an insane, terrible divorce, and uh... So when uh, Mr. Brunson finally left, he said, like, you know, screw it, we're gonna build a parking garage. So that became a parking garage. Uh, and, of course, oh, you know what I didn't think here is the, the Crocker Mansion, which is super famous. That was torn down in 1989 to build the Elks Lodge. Uh, and, of course, it's probably, like, one of the most famous and iconic Bunker Hill houses. Remember, at the very beginning, we talked about the Bradbury Building, and the guy who wanted to, like, look down the third of Broadway and see this wonderful business block, like, he would have looked for, you know, his tower. Um, he got, I mean, with the like, the like, California, the, the desert cactus, it's, I mean, total masterpiece. You know, Dub Pneumonia Hall, like, I Howl Roach Studios, and a whole bit. You all know the story. Torn out in 1929 for a parking lot. Because, Lord knows, it was the people, they would take, um, court flight. You know, there's Angel's flight, there's also a court flight. And on the other thing, they would take it up, and they're like, now that we're here, we need parking. We would tear down that terrible old place. My next talk about Bunker Hill, I've just decided, is going to be about taste. About America's changing tastes from Downing to, if you're familiar with Robert James Downing, 19th century landscape architect, to Arts and Architecture magazine, and the way it refers to Bunker Hill. So here for that, yes, taste and how taste is destroyed Bunker Hill. America's changing taste. So it's going to be completely aesthetic. Uh, no politics in there whatsoever, I promise. <laughs> but she likes the politics. If you like, you like the psychology part, you know, I'll do a psychological study of Bunker Hill. I don't know, maybe you will be a guest speaker. Okay. But also, do you know what taught a lot of good stuff too? Was the Force Street Viaduct. And the viaduct was actually done by the Division of Highways. I know you know them. But you know who's here today? Gordon Patterson, whose family actually Owned houses up there, lived up there, he used to go up there and like cut the lawns on some of the like greatest houses in all the Bunker Hill when he was a kid. He knows about it. The Crest Home, I believe your family home, was right there. And then there's when the first street cup came through, took out a ton of stuff. And that was a big civic project. But what was the biggest civic project to take out 
an enormous amount of Bunker Hill. Everything north of First Street, all the way to Temple, was the Civic Center. People forget that. People will go to much of the way that nobody remembers, like everybody misplaced, uh, misplaced, you know, evicted for Jordan Downs. Nobody goes to the Chandler Pavilion and goes to see an opera and thinks about the poor people displaced for that. Um, but think about all the people, you know, The Orichiga family, the, the most iconic evictees in all of Los Angeles, if everyone was allowed to make up their minds who gets to stay and who doesn't when it came to eminent domain, true, we still have Bunker Hill, but we would have no schools, we would have no roads. Wait, actually, that would still be fun. <laughs> what am I saying? Uh, and we would have no music center. We would also have no civic center. It would be fun too. We still have the Hill Street Tunnels, which was part of the Civic Center project. And I'm going to dispel another myth. Not a myth so much as I always hear this. This Bunker Hill was, Bunker Hill certainly was, like the greatest concentration of gingerbread, scroll work, and the Victorian architecture, and the turrets, and. Uh, but you know what else it had in spades that people say to always forget? Because the apartment explosion happened right about 19, 2, 3, 4, 5, to about 1960, Mission Revival. The Mission Revival is super important in the history of Los Angeles for a whole number of people in America, especially for Los Angeles for a whole number of reasons, up to and including its relationship to incipient modernism and the way, you know, modernism sort of grew out of a response to our own vernacular architecture and the way in which, of course, you know, Blank expanses of walls, flat roofs, you know, the fenestration. Now, what I'm going to talk about here is not exactly Irving Gill, but the relationship between Southern California modernism and mission vernacular Spanish architecture um, cannot be denied. And we had some really first rate, Arthur Haley, of course, with not so much about the hill, if you're familiar with Arthur L. Haley, there's the Hotel Mon and Olive. This is the Schlosser, which actually spent most of its early years known for whatever reason is the Castle Craig. Um, but it was a very important thing for Mission Department. Um, the famous hotel the story of, I said famous because uh, the most terrifying serial killer in American history, Robert Nixon, committed his most terrifying crime in the hotel the story. Oh, Brickbat killer. The Brickbat killer. Um, the book, uh, uh, the Brigada, which is sort of mission meets friendly independent beds. If anyone here is familiar with Bunker Hill at all, I know some of you are, and you know the Lovejoy at the corner of Third and Grand, which also has the friendly independent bed. That's also Charles Ellis. He just loved her. Another Joseph Catherine Newsom. And the great by him. And the St. Regis, I've never figured out how to design this, it's driving me crazy, but I keep digging. And of course, the Fremont Hotel by the end of the John C. Austin. This was taken out not by the CRA, but again by the Fourth Street Viaduct in 1954. And what a piece that was. And, and one of the reasons why the Rich started moving out of Bunker Hill in droves was because, for example, here's the, you know, the the Leonard James Rose Mansion. We had this great year review of the entire city from about 1888 to about 1902, and then they built this in front of him. He was like, well, there goes the neighborhood. So he said, well, then we moved to West Adams, Beverly Hills, Hollywood, all these other crazy places you could go. You know, these big yowling hinterlands of Los Angeles to the west. Another thing they'll tell you, and one of the things that the, the CRA would always say, there are no modern, there's no modern buildings. Everything was built before 1919. That's why it's all falling down. Copy cop, I said. Well, the other thing the CRA always said, this is what I was like, the CRA, they were supposed to be, you know, these, these um, left liberal uh, progressives. Um, but they always talked about, like, we had to tear it down because it was full of moral offenders of both sexes. That was their favorite phrase. I was like, you guys are so progressive. Leave the poor moral offenders alone. I'm not bothering you, but I guess, you know, not everybody was as progressive then as we were progressive now. So, how did I get on that? All right.
this place is great. Look at that curved eyebrow canopy. That's where the snack bar was. Got these tennis ball courts. Look at these kids. They're happy. You know, they said that like juvenile delinquency was going, was running rampant all over Bunker Hill. Parking cars everywhere on Bunker Hill. There's a parking on the kids' playground. Yeah. Where are the parking cars around the kids' playground? Yeah. That's probably the kids' cars. Right here, this is uh, the corner of Bunker Hill Avenue and Temple. This is great old uh, Art Deco. It was the Federation of Jewish Welfare Organizations by Marcus Miller. And one of the most interesting and intriguing uh, modern buildings on the hill, of course, the Student King Oliver House. Um, the, the back house was built in 52. These two front parts were built in like 56 and 58 as apartments. Um, this guy was interesting. He was actually a, uh, I used to think he was an attorney, it turns out he was a chemical engineer. And he basically said, like, I don't care what's going to happen about the hill. I have this amazing view. I'm going to go here. It's right after the, uh, this is where the little part very long story, I wrote about 10,000 words on it. Go on the Uncle Hill hillside and you read the whole story. But again, the idea that there was no modernism on the hill. The Nedgear and Skilling uh, 1910 Auditorium Hotel gets a clean line in the 30s. Um, and uh, perhaps by Club Gilman, you don't know. But it does get an army and Davis boogies right here at the Fifth Apollo. So we even had Googie on the hill. Oh my god. Why am I showing you the Burns house? It's like that just looks like some chromium 1905 house on Flower Street. This is what the interior of a house on Bunker Hill looks like. So much so that Julius Shulman went and shot the Burns house. Now okay, not every interior. In fact, Leonard Nadell, the photographer for the CRA, went and shot every slum he could. So if you look at the the Nadeau photographs, it's like nothing but just like the most misery you can possibly see. It's like every outdoor toilet. No, don't get me wrong. There were some bad, there were lots of bad areas around there. There was lots of outdoor toilets. The area just west of the 3rd Street Tunnel, down on Clay Street, that's where all the, the hypes come out. But uh, I just think it's, it's interesting that there was stuff like this. Wait, wait a second. Go back. What is that strange animal head on the, on the right photograph? Yeah, he wants to know, what's the strange animal head? What is that? No, on the right. What that? is that thing? Yeah. Yeah. Next, uh, next to the giant lamp. Yeah, right above your little pink, pinky. Bet. What, what is it? It looks like a head of an animal. That's a coffee table. That's a coffee table? Yes. Okay. Can you come up here and point at it? Now you're pointing at it right now. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's a coffee table. Oh, okay. This is the arm of a chair. It looks like a paper mache animal head. It's got two now you're pointing at the wrong thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, in, oh, the, in the foreground. This, I don't know. It seems crazy. <laughs> what, what time is it exactly? Okay, perfect. Richard Dowdy? Richard. Gordon will say, Gordon has told me, he's, we talked a lot about Wolfgang Berkeley, he said, like, yeah, there was this one house on the corner that was always kept, because you always hear about it. Every house was dilapidated. We say, like, especially this one house in like Second and Bunker Hill, they always kept it painted, they always kept it neat. There were a lot of houses like that, but this one especially, they always kept it painted. I found this great photo of it in 1996, and then it's looking very much the same in 1962, looking neat, looking clean. In fact, the Hilltrap mansion, here it is looking dilapidated, and it only looks that way because this is actually as it's being constructed. Um, gets an entire makeover. You know, repainted, re-roofed, everything, all repainted. Um, in about 1950, unfortunately, it gets taken out by the Fourth Street cut in 1954. So it gets completely restored. Um, yes, faith in the future. Not that it wouldn't have been torn out. So, so these are my final words. I'm going to play the stuff. Is that so? The idea being that even though yes. It was dodgy. It was, you know, the, the CRA would always come out and talk about, of course, you know, the moral defenders and the narcos and the juvenile delinquents. Um, you know, and for a long time, the photos that we had to look at, of course, were like the, the Leonard Nadell photos because they were online, like LPL. But little by little, this other stuff starts to happen. 
the Palmer Connor uh, color codicone show. Again, it goes against this whole sort of common conception of the black and white noir old, which we love, don't get me wrong, but it was a neighborhood. It was a mature neighborhood. But there were flowers. There were, it was mostly, you know, these older people. It was, it was a retirement community. It was, it was pensioners. You know, it was predominantly these elderly people on pensions. It had some dodgy elements, but, and it was red, oh, we could talk all about like the home loans and redlining and all that stuff, that's a whole thing. D37 is Bunker Hill's official redline uh, box. Um, it was actually one of the reds, but it was only 8.3% uh, non-white. It was a very, very white community. It's really hard to become redlined by the Homeowners Association and be that lily white, but apparently it has some dodgy elements. But overall, especially like somewhere along the Hill Avenue, you know, you've got Rose the Cat Lady, you know, immortalized in the Leo Pulidi paintings, and then like, here's a photo of her, you know? Pretty flowers. That's George picking, Manfo? Hmm? George Manfo. Another George Manfo, yeah. Ladies picking their cats. Uh, Gordon will talk about how like like the difference was, you know, up there you could actually hear the pigeons coo. You could hear the sort of very distant roar of the city below. But but up there it was quiet, calm, there was very low car ownership, the pigeons would coo. You know, there were a bunch of alternative proposals presented to one more minute and then I'm done this one. Richard has that word but uh, to the CRA. People came up and they said, we have this better idea. If we, if we need housing, make, and, and, if, and if it's blighted, and if it's this terrible problem, make the owners of these places bring them up to code. Because there was, they were saying, yeah, there was actually a provision, there was another housing act, which I didn't even talk about, the 1954 housing act, which allowed for these long-term loans, these low-interest loans, these FHA loans, to owners so they can bring them up to code. And you know what? You know what the CRA said? They said it couldn't be done because mixed use. Common goes to mixed use, and mixed use causes blight, which is really ironic because nowadays we're we're, we're trying to socially engineer all this green, new urbanist walkability commercial, residential, and stuff like that, but that, back then it cost blight, and that's why we couldn't bring anything up to code. Couldn't do it. It was beyond redemption. We just had to tear it down. So, here's poor Lucy Davis. This is the, the Melrose Hotel, one of the super famous ones I'm sure you've seen the outside of. Probably never seen the inside of it. There's a shot of it. Designed by Joseph Catherine Newsom in 1989. It was built as a home, not as a hotel, uh, but by um, Mark O'Connor. And uh, she lived there for 40 years. Torn down. Yep. And this is my last slide, my final slide. So that's what I want to end on. Just gotta touch the screen. And that's what I want to end on. This thing. I hope I haven't annoyed you too much. But overall, I hope I have. Uh, and I hope that you come away thinking about Old Bunker Hill as. Well, first, that I burst a lot of your bubbles about the things you believe. But if you come away believing in anything, if you believe that like these lovely, old, wonderful communities, if people are left on their own, moral offenders though we may be, we usually make our own decisions pretty well. And I just want to point out this great old shot. This is actually the exact same shot. They shaved off so much of Bunker Hill that where you used to look down from Bunker Hill Avenue towards Grand on 3rd, you know, look up at it, looking up at that same intersection. Like, that's how much they hated Bunker Hill. They had to actually chop all the dirt out because even the dirt the people stood on was somehow infected with their vice and depravity. And you know what? It's just wrong to be that worked up about stuff. Except for me. Thank you. Nathan, thank you so much. Um, Nathan, we agreed you were going to um, show some film clips and, and talk through them, right? Oh, wow. Well, I, 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 I,
I think we all have sound, so I don't really need to talk. Okay, well, you're, I'm sorry, you're going to introduce each individual clip. No. No. Are you going to introduce okay, so the set of clips? No, title. Okay, Maybe I want you to explain to us what we're about to watch. I think, uh, it was, certainly it was very cinematic, you know, um, it fulfilled all of the sort of typical, uh, you know, Los Angeles is bright and sunny, but it casts long shadows, kind of noir ideals of, um, decrepitude and all that great stuff. The fact is, honestly, the people of Bunker Hill, that's great, the people of Bunker Hill probably wouldn't get pissed off at like film crews, so film crews, like, if you've ever seen, uh, what's the movie about the Canadian plan, Canadian, someone, those are the horrors. Like, there's great stories about like, yeah, we had to shoot there because it's the only place where people wouldn't give us a hard time, so they look out the windows and be like, eh. Everywhere else, they would like, be cops everywhere, like saying, like, hey, you need a permit. Bump and you basically, you like, you know, it's a free for all. Um, but one of the most interesting, weird, antiquated things you can shoot on was Angel's Flight. Angel's Flight shows up again and again and again because, like, if you want to do something sort of really that stands out, you're running away from the cops or whatever, you know, or you're a monster, like, trying to escape, you know. Jump on Angel's Flight and escape that one. It really stands out. So, we put together a little uh, Angel's Flight compendium, chronologically, um, not complete. Uh, you'll notice some of your favorites are not here. Uh, the incredibly strange creatures who stopped living and became mixed up zombies, I think, is absent. Uh, there's a great Angel's Flight scene in that. Um, but otherwise, there's some good stuff here. So, enjoy. I'll pull that back.